So um, I'm going to be doing shoulder disorders. Okay, shoulder disorders. So I'm going to be moving through the body over the next two days. So we covered hips this morning. Um, hips, I mean, you've got a lot of flexibility in the hip, but not nearly as much flexibility as you do in your shoulder. Yeah, there's a guy in the fourth row giving me something right now. Is that right? Yeah, I'm talking about you, sir. All right, so shoulder and he was working it. He's in Vegas. This is being recorded. It might not stay in Vegas. All right, so we're going to be talking about shoulder anatomy. There's the shoulder anatomy. Know it. All right, there's lots of muscles, but there's, there's like three, four, five muscles that are really important. And those are the rotator cuff muscles. There's four of them, but those rotator cuff muscles are really important. There's some bursas around the shoulder. You're gliding that joint through that joint space. So you've got some bursas to consider. There's only one bursa shown there. And then you also have some ligamentous uh, attachments to hold that shoulder in. Now, this is another closer up view, and you can see some of more of the bony anatomy because we've removed the muscles off this one, and so you can see more of the bony anatomy. But, you know, like there's not a lot to hold that shoulder in. And why is that? Because we evolved. Now, you could say we were intelligently designed. I'm not going to get into that argument. But, you know, it's so this, this, this shoulder can bring this opposable thumb to all of these various things, and we can reach and grasp and do stuff. But this makes the shoulder very vulnerable for being dislocated. It is the most dislocated joint, right? And this is the most vulnerable spot. When it's up over your head like this, that's when it pops out. That's when it pops out. It's very, very vulnerable anatomy. Um, but it gets you great mobility. So it's incredibly complex, yes. The bursas are important. I try to emphasize that through that for that gliding motion so you don't get that crunch, 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 crunch like I have. Um, you don't have a lot of bony stability around there. It's pretty universal joint-like. Um, and it's really dependent on those rotator cuff muscles, the joint capsule and the AC joint. So when you do a shoulder exam, it's pretty simple. Inspect, palpate, range of motion, strength testing and sensory testing. One of the mistakes we make, and I've seen this happen because I've done this mistake, is that you walk in and the patient says, yeah, my shoulder's really killing me. Okay? You have to take that shirt off. You have to undress them. You have to look at the shoulders if you're going to examine the shoulders. Right? We usually make a commission rather than an omission. Or, sorry, we rather make an omission. We don't look. And so what happens is you go in, they say their shoulder hurts, and you don't get around and behind them, and you go, well, how long have you had that rash? Oh, the shingle, right? So you actually have to inspect. And it's nice, you've got two of them, right? And so look and say, okay, from the front, from the back, and see if there's anything obvious there. Palpate along the bony ridges, along the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, along teres minor, along the deltoid, over the AC joint. Palpate along there. Do that range of motion. Get them to flex and extend. To do the external rotation, the internal rotation, right? The AB, abduction and the adduction. Get them through that range of motion so you can figure out what their shoulder is doing. And it's pretty easy to tell. They're like, yeah, I can't get it past there. You can't get it past there. You're thinking, oh, they, well, is it a painful arc? Is it a frozen shoulder? What's going on? So you've got to put them through that range of motion and then do some strength testing and sensory testing. We'll do a lot more about the sensory stuff when I get down into the hands and stuff like that in another lecture. So let's talk about the AC separation, the acromioclavicular separation. Now, I don't know what the main mechanism of injury in your country is, but it's hockey players for us, right? They go into the boards and they pop their shoulder, right? And if you've ever seen an interview in the locker room of any hockey player, they both got two little, you know, big bumps right on their shoulders, right? And I've got right, one on each of mine, right? From going into the boards, you get checked into the boards, and you pop your AC joint, and it hurts for months and months and months, and you'll just get that oh, in that right position. Now, it's usually pretty simple management. Don't play hockey, Ken. Take some time off, some ice, some rest, maybe some NSAIDs, some acetaminophen, and this too shall get better. Now, they have different degrees of separation for an AC joint. So the first degree of separation, a type 1, is I can't see the separation. 
Okay, so the acromion and the clavicular joint line up perfectly, and that little fibrous ligament between them, that space, is lined up perfectly, so your two fingers connect. When you look at the x-ray, those two things connect, and that's a type 1. If they're really sore right there, and the x-ray looks normal, it's a grade 1 separation. It's sort of like a Salter-Harris fracture in a growth plate in a child. I don't see it. That's a Salter-Harris 1. Okay, same thing for the shoulder separation. Now a type two is if you bring your fingers together where the AC joint comes together, they're still overlapping. That's a type two. And the type three is they're not communicating, they're not like in line with each other, right? They're off like this. So that's a type three. And again, it's rest, ice, and NSAIDs. Now you can get into a shoulder impingement syndrome and this is the soft tissue swelling around the shoulder, and you get this friction. So when you put them through a range of motion, you get this <laughs> Maybe I should put the microphone closer to this, so actually it's only on my right side. But yeah, you'll get this grinding sensation as it moves up, and it's impinged, and it's called a painful arc syndrome. So they can move fine here, they can move fine here, but it's in that painful arc of about 30 to 45 degrees right in through there that's really sore. And you can see that when, they, when they're AD, abducting their arm, they'll wince and they'll be in pain when they're doing that. And again, it's anti-inflammatories for that. And this shows you a closer up view of that shoulder being impinged as, is, as, the, uh, as the rotator cuff muscles glide along that bursa and get stuck with the inflammation. And so that's why the anti-inflammatories are key. And you get into trouble if you know, the patient can't take anti-inflammatories right, because of GI issues or other issues. Then you can get calcified tendonitis. Oh, have you ever looked at a shoulder x-ray and go, what the heck is that? That big calcified thing along the arch over the dome of the humerus. It's like, what? And, that, and that's calcification of the tendon. And you can see, you know, like down here it's fine, but getting up into the joint, that's just going to grind right through the joint. Right? So you can see how you'd get an impingement on that. Again, rest, ice, NSAIDs, physiotherapy maybe. Um, you can inject steroids in this. And everybody gets excited about steroids you know, for injections. It's, steroids are like um, horseshoes and hand grenades. Right? You just got to get it close. Right? And so like, oh, am I in the right? So just put some in there. It'll spread out and do its magic and all the evil humors will go away. Um, I had one person um, lecture me and teach me about this. I think his name was Billy Mallon, who said, you could, you could do a shoulder injection right about here, <laughs> and it would work. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. All right, so um, bicep tendon rupture. This is the gun show. This is where they pop that long head of the bicep, and they come in with the Popeye arm. Okay? Now, it usually is involving strenuous exercise. So, you know, you go to the gym, and you've all been to the gym, right? And you see that one guy in the gym, and he's up there like that, and he's doing the curls, right? And you see, I have to do it sideways. And he's in the curls, and he's going, rrr, rrr, and I'm like, the elbow isn't even flexing, right? It's just he's rocking back and forth, doing the curls, right? Oh, yeah. Or it's picking up something heavy and stuff, and they pop the long head of the bicep, and it goes, right? Now, there is risk factors for this, and the fluoroquinolones, we, hopefully we think about the fluoroquinolones, right? Cipro is the classic example, ciprofloxacin, for the ruptured Achilles tendon. And you know, when this drug first came out, they didn't realize that it was going to have this side effect in, until post-surveillance, until they started getting case reports. And yeah, like, you know, an antibiotic causing your Achilles tendon to rupture? Weird. Right? But that's why you need big data sets to be able to pick up that stuff. Well, it can also hit any of the, lig any of the um, uh, tendons, and you can pop the long head of the bicep. And one of the interesting things about the fluoroquinolones is that when you're on a quinolone, it's not just when you're on it that you're at risk. You're, on, you're at risk for weeks, potentially months afterwards, after you've completed your course of antibiotics for these types of tendon ruptures. You can get an ultrasound if you want, and if you're good at that, you can look for those tendon ruptures. Thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, this is a bit different. That, you know, you've got your thorax, right? You've got your scalene muscles, and then you've got the neurovascular bundles that come down your arm. And you can get these people getting compression of their nerves and arteries coming down into their hands. 
And you can get the compression of just the nerve, you can get compression of just the vessel, or you can get both. And how do you test for this? Well, they've got the Adson test and the EAST test to test for this thoracic outlet syndrome. And so the thoracic outlet syndrome, this is, you know, like the, the, the Adson test, you get the, you know, the, the, the practitioner is there, you know, with the blacked out eyes and the blue shirt on, it's the patient without the shirt on, and they feel the radial pulse and the person gets to turn their head that way and the pulse goes away as they turn towards the affected size and, and, um, and deviate the head. I have never made that diagnosis. Wow. If you do, you're a star. Okay, seriously, like milk that one for as long as you can because that is, oh yeah, and then I did this and the pulse went away and I'm like, wow, you are excellent. You're more than an advanced practice provider. You're an ultra practice provider. I've never made this diagnosis, all right? Um, at least doing this. Now there's the, the ease test and yeah. I, I always think it's like a wedding. I mean, you put your arms up and you go da 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 No, you just put your arms up like this for three minutes and you open and close your hands. And during that opening and closing of the hands, the affected side will experience numbness, fatigue, weakness. So you can get both vasculature and nervous side of the system doing this, okay, for a thoracic outlet syndrome. Clavicle fractures, well, this is the most common fracture that we have. This is the most common fracture seen. Think about it. You can get it from birth <laughs> right up until death, right? So if you're a little too aggressive, you know, and you've got a, like, a little dystonia, uh, you can get that fractured clavicle. So um, it's the most common. Uh, my younger sister uh, still has not forgiven me for breaking her clavicle when we were tobogganing one year and uh and and it's a cosmetic issue right you know like she can't wear these strapless dresses because she has this big bump there right when i landed on her from uh doing uh tobogganing so uh, she's never forgiven me it comes up every christmas anyways um so uh so it's usually from a fall onto your shoulder not your big brother falling on you um you may fracture it in several places so it may be shattered um, it's not always an isolated injury. Usually it is, but it's not always. So if you, if you have a fracture there, think about the upper rib cage and, and the mechanism of injury and stuff like that. Think about the neck as well, because obviously some force has been put in this area, and while the clavicle may not be life-threatening, here is, right? So think about the neck, think about the thorax when they have a fractured clavicle. Now the treatment for it, um, again, this is going back. This was me. You know, this was like the figure of eight. That's that says no, okay? It's more expensive. They get axillary thrombosis. It's painful, more non-union, malunion. And so this figure of eight thing that I was taught, and of course it takes 17 years for medical information to reach the patient's bedside. So don't do that. Put them in a forward sling, comfort position. Now, sometimes they're going to have to go to orthopedics, you know, urgently if they've got tenting of the skin, the skin's been violated, things like that, then you're going to need the orthopedic consult. And sometimes they will open these up and fix them, right? And they're doing that more and more. All right, let's go through the rotator cuff. This is the sits muscles, the supraspinatus, so above the spine, the infraspinatus, below the spine, subscapularis, below the scapula, and the teres minor out front. And you, you, you'll get these various causes of, this, uh, of these uh, rotator cuff injuries. They're not pleasant, um, they're painful, and you'll see that they'll get um, with uh, abduction, right? That's when they'll get sore. As the, and, and it's not passive, so you can lift their arm up so it's not an impingement. The impingement hurts because there's an impingement there, and you passively lift them up, it hurts. If somebody's got a rotator cuff injury, you can lift them up, and it won't hurt, but if they try to lift it up, if it's active motion, that's gonna make your distinction between those two. Now I love this, this has got vectors on it, right? It's like I'm back in physics class again, I love it. And it shows you the vectors of how that shoulder is held in, right? And the three, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis come over the top and are on the greater trochanter, but that teres minor isn't, and that's what's gonna hold your shoulder into joint. So somebody came up to me um, just before the talk and wanted to talk to me about shoulder dislocation. Wherever she is, here it is. 
So we're going to talk about shoulder dislocations. Now anterior, that's the most common. Anterior, anterior, anterior. Those are the shoulder dislocations we uh, see. And you can usually recognize, this is like the end of the bed, little old lady diagnosis. This is the young man go, ah, ah, ah. They come in like that, right? Don't touch my arm, don't touch my arm. And you can see it, right? It's, it's like the end of the, yeah, that's dislocated, right? Unless there's a history of trauma and stuff and you're worried about a fracture and stuff, you really can usually make the diagnosis. And especially if they go, I did it again right? That's really easy to die. I love it when they come in. You know, did you fall? No, I just popped it. I put my arm up and I was reaching for the Cheerios and yeah. Okay, it's out, right? So do you need an x-ray on every single patient that comes in with a possible dislocated shoulder? No. Use your clinical judgment. If there's a history of trauma, if it's an elderly person, if it's somebody with osteoporosis, I get it, right? But if that's that guy, yeah, this is number 12, right? Do they need a pre-reduction film? No. They can have the post-reduction film. And um, posterior dislo uh, dislocations, those are rare. Um, they put down that maybe due to seizures. And so, you know, the classic story is the status epilepticus, and they're seizing and seizing and seizing, and everybody's running around, oh my God, oh my God, they're seizing. Hopefully that's not what's happening. But, you know, that tension level when somebody's in status epilepticus, right? And so they finally tube the person, get the seizure under control, hopefully. I mean, they're paralyzed. They may still be seizing. But anyways, um, and then they intubate them, and they go the post-reduction films, or the, or the post-intubation films, and it's all good, right? The tube's in, everybody's happy, send them off to the ICU. And then apparently, four days later, they wake up and start complaining about their shoulders. And it's like, oh, yeah, if you're seizing like this, they can pop out both shoulders, and it can look pretty symmetrical on that x-ray, and you're looking for the tube, not for the shoulders. So if you get someone in status, make sure you look at their shoulders, that they haven't dislocated their shoulder. This is where the posterior dislocations can happen. And then there's this something called um, luxation erratica. Erratica? It sounds like, it, it, you know, to me, it sounds like a luxury hotel in Vegas or an overdose of Viagra. But, um, <laughs> but it's a very unique, um, it's a very unique uh, dislocation, anterior dislocation, where they come up like this. And they come in with their hand on their forehead, and you go, hello, sir. Hello? You, you can put your arm down. I can't. Oh, no, really, you can put, I can't. And that's this, okay? That's the anterior dislocation like that, and we'll go through that. So, um, of course, you know, you're going to expect, you're going to palpate, but here's where the neurovascular stuff, document that. Document, they got a good strong pulse, that C5, that axillary nerve along the deltoid is intact prior to you doing anything. Now, some people will say, you know, getting the x-ray is going to protect my tuchus, you know, medically, legally, right? That if I get the x-ray before, right, that's going to be helpful. Well, you know, sometimes if, when you put the shoulder back in, you can have a fracture dislocation, you can have a little avulsion fracture and stuff, and if you have an x-ray before that doesn't show it, and you have a post-reduction film that shows it, you're in bigger trouble than, oh yeah, no, the post-reduction film shows it, but I didn't do a pre-reduction film, so who knows if it was broken before I put it back in. Now, that's not for fractured fracture, that's for avulsions, okay? All right, so um, <clears throat> pre-reduction films may not be necessary. Yeah, I've gone through that. The mechanism, you know, if they're a chronic dislocator and stuff like that. But if they're an older person, osteoporotic, there is a mechanism of trauma, you're worried, absolutely get that x-ray, pre-reduction, absolutely. There are all the shoulder techniques, you need to know them all. Sorry, no, okay. Um, so... And, and this, you know, I think this shows you that there's not really one great way. Get, get to know two or three, you know, so you have plan B and plan C, but you don't have to know all of these. And there's some great YouTube videos on this that can show you in more detail. And I'm going to be around for the next two days. I can talk more about this with you. Get to know the ones you like to do that work well for you that you're happy with. There are some dangerous ones that I'm going to flag not to use. They're not on this list. They're in a separate list. Okay? So there's the Simpson one. Uh, um, and what you do is you get the patient to lie in the gurney, prone. They put their arm down, and you put the weight around their wrist. And this is key. Actually, they can't be holding the weight, because if they hold the weight, they'll do this and protect the shoulder. It's got to be on the wrist, just slow traction, dragging that back into position. And then there's that Jedi trick, the, the, the scapular rotation technique where you go, oh, we're going to put your shoulder back in. 
This is the zen. This is the calm. This is the slow rotation. This is the massage. Now, you have to explain that when they're undressed that you're not massaging their neck. You're actually trying to put their shoulder back. What are you doing back there? You know, so you have to explain because, you know, like if they've dislocated, they're expecting some kind of, you know, it took a lot to put it out. They're thinking it's going to take a great deal of force to put it back in. I've been playing with this technique. I can't say that I've had great success yet, but other people have had great success with just the scapular rotation technique where you push it back medially. Posterior. There's the fares. That's the fast, reliable, and safe. That's the, um, the picture where the uh, patient's holding the gurney with that arm, and then the doctor is pulling traction along that axis that way. All right? You can lift it up as well. That's the spazo. Um, hennepin technique, this is the one I tend to use. I tend to have the patient down and I do gentle external rotation and elevation. And, it, and, it's, and, it, and, it's, and it's not a forceful movement, it's not about muscle strength, it's about this strength. You know, a little bit of sedation, a little bit of sedation, and then just gentle, slow traction. And it really works well. Now, there's other sh um, ones that you're supposed to be avoided. The one, uh, the, the Hippocratic method, okay, so that's the first one that was ever described. Hippocrates, right? You guys know this one? The person's lying on the ground. You put their foot, your foot, in their axilla, and you pull. Okay, not good. Axillary injuries, fractures, and stuff like that. And that's that brute force technique. You want to be gentle, slow, it'll pop back in. Okay. The other one is the Eskimo technique, and I don't know if that's culturally insensitive to call it the Eskimo technique anymore, be, um, but y you, know, y you think about, this is where it was described. Um, so th these people would be um, kayaking through, like hunting, through glaciers and things like that, looking for polar bear and seal. And you know, the best way to pop out your shoulder is above like this. So if you've got your kayak paddle and one paddle, one end of the paddle hits the wave and that pops that shoulder back, right, and it pops out, now you and your, your, your hunting partner are on the ice flow and you either get eaten by a polar bear and die or you put the shoulder back in. So it's sort of like, you know, harm reduction. And what they did was they would just stand over their body and hold up their arm while they lay on the ice and sort of just did a little motion there to try to put it back in. But if that didn't work, you did this and you put their foot on your chest, so it's almost like the Hippo Hippocratic method, and pulled up. But again, putting that shoulder back in and tearing it apart and having fractures was a lesser evil of getting eaten by a polar bear. So just avoid these ones. And there's a YouTube video link, you should have that in your notes there, that you can go to and look at some of these in detail. This is supposed to introduce you to the technique. But again, it's not about strength. It's about slow, progressive application of force and adequate sedation if necessary. Posterior sh shoulder dislocations, they're easy to miss. Absolutely, they're easy to miss because they're not as common. And that shoulder looks like it's in almost, doesn't it? Like it looks like it's in, but the key is that it's rotated so you've got your greater trochanter and your lesser, uh, sorry, your greater tuberosity and your, <laughs> your lesser tuberosity aren't showing like they normally do on a normal PA, right? You don't see it there, right? And what you see is what has been described at the bottom of the slide as a gun barrel. So it's long and then it's got a circle at the top. It looks like a gun barrel. Now, if, if you're thinking education, it's like the light bulb sign. And so if you see that, a light bulb should go off and you should think, hmm, I wonder if this is a posterior shoulder dislocation, okay? Or you can call it a drumstick, depending on what time of day it is and how hungry you are, all right? So um, this is that rare form, that Luxio ere uh, erecta. And so they come in with their hand on their forehead like this. It's an anterior shoulder dislocation. And again, it's gentle uh, traction on that to pull that back into the joint. I haven't had to do one of these. This is very rare. Adhesive capsulitis, not so rare. And it's not so rare because people get into these shoulder injuries. They get immobilized for far too long and aren't encouraged to go through some um, range of motion exercises and so you know you've done your job you've seen them in the department you've gotten them immobilized but we need to take that further step with regards to discharge instructions that they need to do some Codman exercises and we've got a slide on what those Codman exercises because that shoulder you know it's all soft tissue and you get all this inflammation and scar tissue you can get that frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis and you want to avoid that and so that's the Codman exercises and this is where they bend over and do these gentle swirls right I just tell them do the alphabet. I just go, go through the alphabet. 
or what's your address or what's your, you know, like just something to keep it interesting while they go through this gentle and pain is your guide. Pain is your guide. If it hurts a lot, don't do it. But you need that gentle range of motion, right? There's really anything in medicine, I'm not aware of anything in medicine that bed rest for two weeks is good for you. It's not good for backs, hips, shoulders, nothing that I'm aware of. All right, proximal humerus fractures. So you can smash up your humerus and they've got a classification system in orthopedics for. My classification is bone broke, me call. Okay, how many pieces? Lots. Like how many pieces does it need to be in for me to call you? Okay, you're on call, right? This is orthopedics, is this thing on? Orthopedics, yeah. I can do that because I started an orthopedics. I didn't finish it, but I started it. Yeah, um, but yeah, you know, so they've got all these different fracture patterns and stuff. And, they, and, and with PACs and digital uh, radiography, that doesn't really come up that much anymore. I don't have to sit there and describe it. I can just call them up and say, hey, I've, I've got a proximal humerus fracture, humor head fracture, it's in multiple pieces. And then they, oh, what's the name? What's their pin number? Okay, and they pull it up and look at it with you and go, yep, okay. And so, um, I don't need to know the classification system. I don't think you need to either. Now, the, the concern is about putting in a dislocated shoulder. Is it a fracture dislocation? So if I get the LOL, the, the little old lady, and I'm worried about this, then, then I get that pre-reduction film, and I'm like, it's fractured and it's dislocated? I'm not pulling on it, okay? I'm referring that on. Mid-shaft humor of fractures. Um, just, uh, you know, so if it's mid-shaft, uh, one of the things to worry about, the radial nerve that runs down through there in a spiral groove of the humerus can get injured. So we're going to be talking about um, the uh, nerves uh, the, in the upper extremity, and we'll go through those in a separate lecture, but just be concerned about that. But it's really interesting. You just put this, like, slingy-like sort of thing and hang it there, and it does well. It really does well. Um, so it doesn't need to be usually open up and... Uh, uh, operated on, but it is an orthopedic referral. And that's it. Thank you very much.